Now, when I was in college, I came to the conclusion that there is no Satan. It's about my freshman year, my first semester, and of course I was taking on the Bible, and I realized that the Satan character in the Bible really ought to be understood metaphorically, and the more metaphor was frequently misunderstood. I began talking to some of my friends and other students about this, that, you know, Satan is not real, that is uh, something we have to try to understand in another way, and uh, I was astounded at the furor this kicked up in my little fundamentalist college that I was going to at the time. And it came to a peak when a friend, this is an acquaintance really, came to me and he said, some of us have been getting together to, to pray for you. And I said, pray for me, why? He said, we, we understand that you don't believe in Satan and we're praying that you come to believe in Satan. <laughs> and I said, are you listening to what you're saying right now? You are praying for me to become a believer in Satan? Really? Is that what it is? And what about you? Are you shocked or surprised to hear your pastor say that there is no Satan, that Satan is not real? Maybe you are. Well, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. A lot of people do believe in Satan. Many good Christians feel that at some point in their life they've been under the power of Satan. My friend Simon Peter, who was back in Angola, he very much believes that Satan is at war uh, with God over his life. Um, he felt that at times in his life Satan has worked specifically against him, putting obstacles or temptations in his way. And, and a lot of people believe this. So my question is, are we at war? Is there a war? Are we at war with Satan? A lot of places in the Bible mention this. St. Paul seems to think so in the scripture reading that Karen read today. It says that we are at war against principalities and powers and, and forces of evil and spiritual authorities in, the, in this reality. That that's a war that we are at. Um, he said, well what he said in that passage we just read is, we aren't fighting against human enemies but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. The people of the Bible saw reality a very different way than we do, of course. And because the Bible is written over the spread of a thousand years, there's lots of different points of view. But by Jesus' time, people expressed it this way, that there is a physical world and a spiritual world. And each is a reflection of the other. What happens in one affects the other. There is a conflict going on in each of them. Powers are at war with each other. Now none of us would certainly deny that there are powers at war with each other here in this world and maybe even in our own lives. But what, what they said is this is just a reflection of the spiritual war going on in another realm. Um, heaven the place, they say, is where this conflict is taking place. And what happens there happens here, and what happens here happens there. In heaven there are spiritual beings and powers that represent the various peoples and nations of the earth. Israel, of course, was represented by Yahweh and Yahweh uh, God's angels. But Rome would also have some sort of spiritual power that was in this war. And Ethiopia and Gaul and all the nations of the earth, all the peoples of the earth, had their own spiritual spiritual beings that were at war. The conflict between these powers on earth, say between Rome and Persia, reflected the conflict between the angels of Rome and Persia in this spiritual world. Well, this conflict, of course, then extended into our own personal lives, and we would get caught up in spiritual conflict in this world, too. Uh, the beings in the spiritual realm that represented each of us individually were at war with each other, and so there was war between us and other people. Now, a lot of that kind of thinking continues today. People believe that there are conflicts that are simply inevitable with each other. And maybe some of us even think that we are battling against spiritual forces that are reflected in our own lives. It may be. If you are um, a someone who doesn't believe in a personal, actual being of Satan, would you agree that there is still an evil power of some kind in this world? Now, I could stop right there. Or would you like me to continue? Because in the past year, I read this book. It's a theological classic. I should have read it a long time ago. 
Thought I finally got around to it. Engaging the Powers by Walter Wink. Anybody read it? Oh, okay, good for you, Dark. Um, would you like me to read it to you right now? <laughs> or would you like me to tell you what it says? That's better? Tell you what it says? Okay, I'll do that. Uh, I'm glad to hear that because it took me months to read it. So, uh, yeah, okay. it is, um, it's written by Walter Wink, who was a professor at Auburn Seminary in New York City. Um, and I found those arguments and thoughts that he had in there were very, very similar to what I have thought, but just much better said than I ever put it into words. So, um, here's what he said. There is an evil power in this world, at work in this world, an evil power unseen but that is at work here in this world. It is found everywhere and in every, one, every time. It is not a personal being but it is a powerful thing. It is everywhere and it can seem as if it is a demon that is playing with the minds and souls of people. Would you like to know what the name of it is? He says, it is domination. The evil spirit in this world is the spirit of domination, that thing that causes us to try to have power over one another and to set up situations in which we have power and others do not. This, he says, is the power that we are fighting against in this world. This is the evil power that is everywhere and that you can see in the scriptures and hear in the words of Jesus. This is the evil power that we are battling against. The spiritual battle that we wage is to break away, break away from the control of the idea of domination. The idea that we must somehow have power over others. And he says, wherever that happens in the world, it creates disaster and, and danger and all kinds of trouble for people in the world. He says you can even find this idea in the Bible, this, this idea that domination is the way to go, is all places in the Bible. Um, well, let me come back to that. Uh, that. That you can find it right at the very beginning of the Bible. What's the first thing that happens, first story that happens in the Bible? What is it? I'm, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm hearing mumbles, but I don't hear words. Creation. Story of creation. And? Adam, Adam and Eve. The and and what's, what is it that Adam and Eve do? They want to have the power. They, they want to grab power for themselves. And then they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and they have two kids. And what do the two kids do? Cain and Abel. What happens? One of them kills the other. And then you can go on from there and you can find places in the Bible where it is, people say that God has given them the order to kill someone else. Maybe to kill everyone else. And what Walter Wink says is this is the idea of domination that you find in the Bible because people have such a hard time resisting it. Until you get to the message of Jesus, which sort of starts like this. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. There is the Blessed are those who mourn. There is the Blessed are the meek. There is the Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Do you hear that message in the light of what Walter Wink is saying? That the message of Christ is to break away from the evil power in this world, the spirit of domination. Can you see how clear that is in this passage right here? There is nothing in the Beatitudes that talk about having power over others. In fact, it is a blessing for those who are willing to live without that power over others. It's almost impossible to believe that this could be true because of the world in which we live. But this is the persistent voice that breaks through in the scriptures all the time that calls for humans to learn to love and to live with justice. 
toward each other. A voice that understands that God is not calling us to kill one another, but that God is calling us towards justice and love, and that that is the domination, that is the, the, the enemy of domination, is love and justice for one another. And it finds its culmination in the message of Jesus. Yet even those people who are most connected to Jesus struggled with the idea of this. Uh, nope, I'm back again. They struggled with this idea of, of justice and breaking away from domination. How many of you have heard of James and John? What do you know about them? Anything? Brothers. They were brothers. Disciples of Jesus. And at one point they're traveling around with Jesus. And Jesus goes to a city where the people don't want to have anything to do with them. And as they leave that city, James and John, disciples of Jesus, who have been traveling with him and learning from him, what do they ask Jesus if they want them to do? Do you know? Yes. They say, Jesus, would you like us to pray for fire to fall from heaven on that town that just rejected us? They're standing next to Jesus and they still can't get away from this idea that somehow they must have power over others. And we struggle with it too. So it is that St. Paul warns us in this passage of Scripture. you got to be ready for this spiritual warfare. You have to be prepared for it. And of course the tricky part is, as soon as you resort to violence to destroy the powers of domination, what have you done? You've begun to dominate. So we have to deal with this. So Paul says you got to do several things. You got to put on the armor of God if you're going to fight this spiritual battle. You got to have the belt of truth because domination is a lie. It is a lie. It is not the way to peace. We do not attain peace by power over others. It is not the way to God. The truth is love. And if it isn't from love, it isn't true. And if it is from love, it's from God, and God is truth. So the first thing you've got to do is hold on to this truth. Domination is an evil sin in this world, and we must break away from it. So Paul says you've got to have the breastplate of justice. A world in which one-seventh of one percent of the people hold half of the world's wealth. Let me say that again. One-seventh of one percent of this world's population holds half of the world's wealth. Justice? Is that justice? What about a nation in which the top 10% wealthiest people own 80% of the nation's wealth? Is that a nation that practices justice? That's a nation that lives by domination and a world that lives by domination and we are called to break against that. We cannot live safely in this world that way. We have to put on the breastplate of justice. And you got to wear shoes that can move. Did you notice I'm wearing my sneakers today? Does anybody here know why I wear sneakers so much? I've told people before. In the neighborhood in which I grew up in, you better have something on your feet that you can run for your life in. Okay? High heels, loafers, flip-flops made no sense in the neighborhood I lived in. You needed a good pair of kids when I was growing up. Paul says, don't mess around with spiritual flip-flops. Put on something that you can move in because you've got to carry a message somewhere in this world. You have to take this message that we are talking about love and justice and peace and not domination. It's your job to take that somewhere and spread that message. You have to be prepared to do that. Have your words ready. Have your ideas ready. Steep yourself in the truth of Christ and take away from the domination era. He also says you need the shield of faith. Because if you are going to follow the path of Jesus, you are going to go against the path that most people are walking. And if you do, you will come under attack. What was the reason James and John wanted to burn that city down? Why? They had rejected Jesus. They had rejected Jesus. And what was it that Jesus said to them that they rejected? Maybe something like, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who seek peace in this world. And they didn't want that. They wanted to kick somebody in the butt. And Jesus said, that isn't going to get us anywhere. And they rejected him. And James and John couldn't take that rejection. And they wanted to kick somebody. 
We have to have this faith so deeply in us, so powerfully believe in the message of Christ that we cannot be stabbed by those who disagree. And finally, he says, oh no, you need the helmet of salvation, he says. Um, So I saw a video the other day of a guy on a motorcycle going down the highway at about 60 miles an hour. And he was somehow laying back on his motorcycle and steering it with his feet on the highway. And let me ask you, if you, do you think he was wearing a helmet? No. He was not wearing a helmet. And one can only hope that he removes himself from the gene pool before he reproduces. <laughs> I didn't say that. That would be an unkind, unloving thing to say. Don't do that. Wear your helmet. Put on your helmet. And the helmet is to the knowledge that your life is in God's hands. Don't let that get away from you. Remember that you are God's child. You have been saved from a world of domination. You don't have to live in it. You can live in a world of peace and love. That's your helmet. Put it on and don't go anywhere without it. And finally, he says, the sword of the Spirit must go with you. And then when I looked up sword of the Spirit on Google for a picture of it, there were tons and tons of pictures of people with swords at full armor, flaming swords, swords that are ready to, to kill with. Because almost everybody that reads this passage about the spiritual armor of God goes right to the idea of, i got to put this armor on so that I can have domination over others. And that's not the point at all. The sword of the Spirit is the power of Christ, the truth of Christ, the life of Christ, and your life is to live as a follower of Christ. And it occurred to me, doesn't that kind of look like a sword as well? And a sword really is a cross. And if you live by the cross, that gives you the power to pierce the disguises of evil, to pierce the powers of evil, to cut through the things that are untrue, to cut through this idea that we all have to have power over each other. It gives you the strength to cut through that if you have the sword of the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ living within you. And that's why we meet here on a regular basis so we can keep ourselves in that because the world would like to take that away from us. So are we at war? Are you at war? Are we at war with Satan? Well, yes, but not some devil with a pitchfork. We are at war against the power that wants us to hurt each other, to rule over each other, to have power over each other. And if we can let go of that in our lives, in our society, in our world, we can see things be differently in this world. Satan's kingdom is built on the power of domination. And we have to take it down. We're not going to take it down by swords or weapons or drones or anything. We're going to take it down by the power of love. But you know what? In this world right now, Satan's kingdom must come down. You've been listening to a sermon by Rev. Stephen Carnahan pastor of High Street Congregational Church in Auburn, Maine. If you feel inspired by what you hear, you're invited to join us in person for worship services every Sunday morning starting at 10 o'clock. Of course, you can always listen to Steve's sermons on the web. New sermons are posted every Monday by midday. Please explore this website for more information about our church or visit our Facebook page at High Street Congregational Church, comma, UCC where you'll find the video version of Steve's sermons as well. We hope that God's presence will be known to you every hour of every day. May God's blessings rest upon you now and always. See you next week.